Good evening. I'm WSHU News Director Terry Sheridan, and welcome to this timely Join the Conversation. We're so glad that you've joined us here tonight. In fact, over 100 of you have registered for this discussion. Our mission here at WSHU Public Radio is to engage our community with quality on-air content and also constructive dialogue. Tonight's event is part of our Join the Conversation series, and that's where we put today's thought leaders together with our public radio audience for amazing and intelligent discussions. The purpose of this event is not to debate this mandate or to debate that rule. What we want to do is talk about the reasoning why some of the decisions were made to provide the context and hopefully discuss solutions and best practices so that the achievement gap doesn't grow and students are able to progress both academically as well as emotionally, socially, while keeping everyone healthy and safe. Now, I'm going to run through some of the logistics right now. First off, your personal microphone is automatically turned off. If you do have a technical issue, the first and best course is simply to refresh your browser. There's a yellow link in the corner of your screen for troubleshooting options. And you can also keep, uh, you can also use the icons at the bottom of the screen to chat with our WSHU staff for assistance. Secondly, this is the first WSHU event that we have done with our new partners at Harkin. They're working with us to help engage with you so that we have a conversation. And it's not just voices from the ivory tower or voices from high talking down to you. Many of you have submitted questions or comments that I will include in the discussion tonight. You'll be seeing more of our work with Harkin in the next few months. We're also trying to look through this topic through a solutions journalism lens. What's that? Well, is there an issue? Well, what are some of the solutions that have been discussed and tried, whether they've worked or not? It's just working on solutions instead of just telling you about the problems. The education of our children has been disrupted for the past year and a half. Decisions were made and are still being made with the best available information and with the best intentions. But that has led to confusion for parents and teachers as the situation on the ground changes. It seems like it changes every day. And it has led to some students falling behind, both academically and socially. But there have been lessons learned over the past year and a half. And with things changing as rapidly as they are, I guess the big question we all have to ask ourselves, and we'll be asking our experts tonight, are what happens if we do have to pivot in the next couple of months? Now, our guests tonight are Daisy Contreras. She is correspondent for The World. That's a daily radio program produced by PRX and WGBH. She'll provide us with a national overview, especially how the pandemic has affected immigrant Latinx communities and how these issues intersect with immigrant life. Daisy is a fluent Spanish speaker, and she is an active member of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and the Society of Professional Journalists. Michael Testani is the superintendent of Bridgeport Public Schools. A Bridgeport native, Superintendent Testani is a career educator and administrator with experience in both Norwalk and the Bridgeport Public Schools. Throughout his over 25-year career, he has worked to improve both the academic and social-emotional growth and development of all students, And our final guest is Dr. Sharon Nachman. She is the Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook's Children's Hospital on Long Island, an international leader in the area of pediatric infectious disease and the treatment of children with AIDS, flu, and measles. Dr. Nachman also directs the Maternal Child HIV AIDS Program. So good evening to you all, and thank you for participating with this. And Daisy, I'd like to start with you to to give us some context. What have you seen across the country and maybe even around the world or on this side of, you know, in this hemisphere, as far as what has happened with the education of our kids through this pandemic? Uh, Has the achievement gap grown and have students who are economically or somehow otherwise disadvantaged, have they fallen behind? Yeah, hi. Um, Hi, Terry. Thank you, everybody, WSHU, for the invitation. Um, Glad to be here and join everybody. So yes, to answer your question, Terry, I've done reporting over the past year on topics focused on immigrant communities across the U.S. And of course, while there are many issues uh, that these communities are facing right now due to the pandemic, one of them, top of mind, is uh, for a lot of these families, education and virtual learning. Uh, at issue here is not just the difficulties uh, students have learned, uh, have faced transitioning to the homeschool setting, families, you know, setting up the Wi-Fi computers, but 
Um, there have also been difficulties getting support for parents who don't speak English, uh, support for students who are uh, considered English language learners uh, and students with disabilities. Uh, many schools and school districts were able to identify the gaps uh, in services early enough, uh, while others uh, lack, were lacking funding and, and staffing couldn't, could not keep up. Uh, the result is students falling through the cracks. Uh, the impact has been greater on kids of color and uh, in low income kids. And, and even with some support, uh, students were still struggling. And, and I'll start, you know, for some context with English language learners uh, to see what that looked like for them throughout the pandemic. Um, I don't want to pick on any one state. All states are grappling with similar situations. But if we look at California, for example, they have a, they offer a very good case study on this. And the U.S. has about five million uh, school aged English language learners or ELL students. Uh, that means uh, they're they might have. The, you know, at home, they speak another language other than, than English, right? California is home to over 1 million of those students. And it's not just Spanish. Many other languages are spoken. Um, but for California's kids, the majority of those ELL students are primarily Spanish language speakers. And um, this, this, uh, this population is also the fastest growing student population in the U.S. And the majority of them are U.S. citizens. So... Um, uh, and then you also have refugee kids, you have kids who are just arriving because they were unaccompanied minors and, and they're learning English, right? And, and so it's a pretty uh, diverse uh, population. So historically, teachers have been tasked with tweaking their, their school curriculum and, and finding additional resources to help these students. And some districts have, have done a really good job and they have prioritized them. Uh, but the teaching approach is, is not the same across the board. And we saw those disparities uh, come up during the pandemic. So in California, going back to California, the pandemic uh, was tough on these kids and their families. Uh, they were already struggling pre-pandemic. They have uh, they, historically the kids have already have a pretty wide achievement gap, uh, opportunity gap, lack of access. But uh, at least there was some support in the classroom, right? And, and so, but all of that went out the window during the pandemic. So now experts uh, in my reporting, uh, experts and English language advocates uh, say the impact on, on these students could be irreversible. Uh, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll emphasize that this isn't just California, uh, but for a state with a lot of Latinos and uh, Spanish speaking kids who need the extra support, uh, even they weren't ready. For, for what happened and what they ended up facing. Um, and there's also California also has a large population of indigenous communities from Mexico and Central America, and their primary ling language isn't Spanish. So like there's that extra barrier that they had to, to like try to tackle, right? And, and so that creates barriers when parents can't advocate for, for their young kids. And so what do experts mean when they say that this could be irreversible? Well, it might take a while to figure out how to bridge that gap left by the pandemic. Uh, a lot of them are asking themselves, you know, how do you help these kids catch up when they were already behind to begin with, right? Uh, and how do you go about identifying who needs the help? Um, and so during the pandemic, English language instruction Frank, uh, these kids were used to taking additional English classes two, three times a week, one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring sessions with, with teachers, and, and it helped. Um, uh, when I was a kid growing up and learning English, I, I had that kind of instruction. And so um, when that type of, of guidance shrinks or that type of tutoring shrinks, it impacts students' abilities to pick up subjects uh, taught in, to them in English. So we're, we're going to see a lot of that in the coming years. Um, it's a domino effect. It, and some experts say that has the potential to impact future graduation rates, retention rates, uh, and higher educational opportunities, which is something that I'm kind of like looking into now, like what impacts uh, how kids, immigrant kids, like approach higher education. And it all starts at a very young age. Right. And again, we, I mean, we talk about it in the, in the business world and in, in our world, and it's almost a half of a joke. We talk about the lost year, but in this case, for these kids, for these students, it truly is a lost year and it might be something that they can't ever make up for. Superintendent Testani, you run the school district in Bridgeport, and that has got to be a challenge, especially during the pandemic. What was your experience over the past year? And did you see some of the things that Daisy was just describing? 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, research already shows that students that have a bad teacher for a year impacts future learning. In, in some cases, some of our kids have had almost no teacher for a year because they chose the remote option or their parents chose a remote option. Um, we really prioritized in-person learning here in Bridgeport. Um, out of the 177 days that we were mandated to, to have um, for the school year last year, we were in person 159 of those days. We really prioritized our special education students, our students with 504 plans and our L population um, right from the beginning that they had the most access to the most in-person learning. Fortunately, for many of our parents of our younger learners in those uh, subgroups, they had to go to work, they had to put food on their tables, so they did send their kids to school. As the kids got older and they were able to make choices um, whether they would go to school or not or stay remote, that's where we saw the most drop off, especially at our high schools. Initially, high school attendance in person started out pretty well, but then as the socializing was minimized because of mitigation strategies, kids, as the year went along, chose to stay home and in some cases um, were tasked to go to work in order to put food on the table to help with the with the household bill. So um, these are things that are concerning. Um, in, in terms of the, the L learners in our district, we have almost 4,000, makes up the ones that are categorized that, that receive services, make up over 20%, over 50%. Uh, of our district is made up of, of Hispanic, whether it be from South America or any of the other countries. So it is a priority for us. We're looking to um, improve the instruction um, in the classroom for students. We're trying to look at the, the programs we have in place for these students, um, improve upon them, provide professional development. As we come out of the pandemic, we've partnered with UCLA Northeast uh, over the next couple of years, they're going to work not only with our ESL bilingual teachers, but also regular education teachers in order to provide the English language acquisition skills in the classroom for our students. So this is a big priority to me. It's, it's near and dear to my heart for a couple of reasons. Number one, I am a first generation. Um, my parents both immigrated. My mom was younger when she immigrated here, so she was thrown into a, an elementary classroom. At that time, there wasn't ESL or bilingual services. Um, and then I live with, my wife is an ESL teacher here in Bridgeport for over 20 years. She again came here um, as a young adult. So um, she is a linguistics expert. <laughs> and so this is something that is really close to my heart. The, the special needs population is the one I have the most concern about simply because of the lack of staffing. Um, we're having extreme difficulties being able to staff classrooms to provide support and services to students. And um, unfortunately, we begin school on Monday, and this is going to be a problematic year for those classes that don't have teachers. We're going to have to see a revolving door of substitutes in those classrooms. And unfortunately, these children are our most vulnerable students and need the most support, and we're not, unable to provide that. Um, so going forward, I think the pandemic has just exasperated and accelerated some of the issues that we already saw pre-pandemic. Now they're just front and center. And I think one of the biggest tasks now is what are we going to be able to do from not only here in the district level, but local, state, and federally uh, to commit to these uh, precious students of ours in order to give them what they need. and, and the ones that are suffering the most are the urban centers and our rural communities who can't compete to invest in the human capital necessary to attract, retain, and maintain consistent high quality instruction in the classroom. So um, this is going to be something that if we don't address immediately, I don't think we can recover from this. Yeah. Dr. Nachman, what can you tell us about children's and their, their health? over the past? Because I know it's rough on adults. It's rough on parents. It's been rough on teachers. It's got to have been horrible for the kids because they, were, they lost so much, you know, not only academically, but socially and emotionally. 
So first of all, I wanted to share that similar to my colleagues on the call, I too am a first generation American and there were no English speaking programs when my parents, I want to say immigrated to the United States. So I certainly grew up in the same type of household, recognizing English as a second language or the need to learn English or go to school to understand English when that was certainly not a language spoken at home. So, you know, I want to say this is a repeating predicament that all of us are in and it's going to continue down the years for our children and our grandchildren as well. The children across the board have certainly been affected by COVID. Some of it with regard to infection and illness, some of it with regard to not coming for the routine medical care, but a lot of it on the psychosocial side. There are now study after study coming out, looking at adolescents to see what's happened with the social isolation. Has there been more drinking? Has there been more drugs? Has there been more suicide attempts? And unfortunately, all of the above are true. We are seeing much more of our teenagers in distress. And unfortunately, we lacked last year a lot of the ability to recognize that distress simply because a lot of them were distant learning or perhaps they were in school but isolated or their friends were not around. So yes, children across the ages, young children as well as our teenagers have clearly been affected by the pandemic as much as their households have been affected. And while we talk about children being resilient, and I do believe that children for the most part are incredibly resilient. I want to say what price that resiliency? Where's the kind of the light at the end of the tunnel? How soon is this gonna be over that we could say, okay, hold out for another three weeks, six months, a year. And then by then we will be back to where we were. It will be a little different, but we'll be closer to where we were. And I think some of the distress that we as physicians have is trying to understand how to get the pandemic to end sooner. How can we plateau those new infections? What are the tools that we have that can make the infection stop? How can we get that message out to people and make it understood to the different communities? Because there's always a lot of distrust of the medical professionals, medical environment, and we need to make sure that our messaging is being heard and received and that we are listening to the questions these parents have. And, Oftentimes when someone says to me, well, can't you mandate a vaccine? Can't you do this? And I say, your child's physician is the expert in your child. If your car makes a funny noise, you don't go online to try to figure it out. Well, maybe some people do, I certainly don't. You go to the mechanic who knows the car, who's familiar with the parts and understands it. Your child's doctor is the same expert in your child. They along with you help you to get to those decisions understand what you're reading, what you're hearing, or what you're not hearing, and talk about it in a non-confrontational way so that everyone can make their opinions known and that we could talk about it and come to a conclusion. And unfortunately, with the advent of social media and all of the people out there and experts out there that may not always be experts in you or your child, those mixed messages are very difficult for us as physicians to come back. We're going to touch on some of those things uh, in a couple of minutes that you brought up, um, especially about the questions parents and teachers might have about specific mitigation effects. But I think one thing that all three of you brought up uh, that I experienced in my own small way teaching a college course was that when you're either remote, you don't necessarily fully see the student. But also if you're remote and or if you're even in some sort of hybrid situation and there's a mask involved and you're not supposed to get close, some of that first line of inter, uh, intervention is not there. You can't see, you can't read someone's face, you know, if they see if they're suffering, you know, in any way. Um, so I, that's something that I think the three of you brought up that, you know, one of the things that happened is, you know, things went on a little longer before maybe that there was some sort of intervention uh, into it. Uh, Michael, can you tell us your thought process about what you were going to do when the pandemic kicked in? I know we here at the radio station, we tabletopped what we thought was going to be the worst case scenario, and it was 10 times worse than what we thought it was going to be. Um, how what, Walk us through your thought process when you first got the word and then realized, oh, my God, this is something that's going to be more serious and more long term than we thought. 
Well, I think the first thing that, that I was thinking is how can we provide good, solid learning experiences for kids? We were not prepared with the technology because as a district, we, were, we weren't a one-to-one -one device, far from it. So where could we at least deploy the devices that we have and get the most access for kids through those devices? And then how can we backfill that with learning experiences that students would be able to pick up or parents would pick up and take home? Um, so initially we did that for two weeks. They were district provided. And during the next phase, as we were putting out these learning experiences from the district perspective by grade level, we were having teachers create uh, learning experiences that were uh, reflective of the curriculum that they were teaching. So we wanted to make this a uniform uh, process. So we had teachers at every grade level at every school submit their learning experiences. And then we had a panel of folks that would either accept or reject and then we would roll out those to, to students um, so that every student had access to high quality um, learning experiences. Um, you can't imagine how many we rejected. Um, again, part of that I think is just the anxiety that teachers were going through. I don't wanna put the blame on them, but we had to make sure that we were able to give kids meaningful learning experiences during that time. Um, and then it was really you know, the planning for the fall um, as we were able to put the Band-Aid and get through the, the latter part of the spring into the end of the school year, uh, what would the fall look like? How can we really put together um, an in-person learning experience for kids that was safe, safe for staff, um, parents felt comfortable sending their kids, um, and maintaining that healthy and safe environment. So um, we put a lot of work into our mitigation strategies. We spent a lot of money on PPE early to make sure that we can get that to our schools. We can get that out to the public in terms of what our mitigation strategies were. Um, I did a bunch of face, Facebook Live. I, I learned how to use social media uh, to be able to answer questions and provide weekly updates throughout the summer to parents. Um, also did a Facebook Live walking through some of our school buildings, demonstrating what our classroom setups were. Uh, just to give a comfort level to parents as they sent their kids back to school, the ones that did choose an in-person option. So that that's kind of it in a nutshell with a lot of, a lot of in between um, worries, conversations, and um, just really gathering a lot of health data from our, our doctors and our health experts. I think they were um, a big help in being able to guide us through the process. Here's a question for all three of you and for uh, uh, for Michael, you know, was there a moment where, again, early in the pandemic or maybe mid pandemic and the same thing with Dr. Nachman, where you just were like, I can't believe this, that, you know, we might lose control of this. And then for Daisy, was there a moment in your reporting when you're like, I can't believe this is happening? Can you can you describe those moments? Certainly, I can. I'm happy to start with that one. I think that when New York State was hitting the thousands and thousands of patients that were infected and we at Stony Brook Hospital, I wanna say went into overdrive and our beds were full, all of elective surgeries or any kind of elective admission was off. And it was just hundreds and hundreds of patients with COVID on the floors. At some point you wake up and say, is there an end to this? And when is it coming? And the good news is that everybody pulled together. There was not one person in the institution from top down to bottom up that wasn't there for someone else. And I think that's really what got us through it. It was an absolute, absolute team event. As you walked in and whatever time you walked in and people were walking out, how was your night? How was your day? How are you doing? Get home, get some sleep. So I really want to say that I suspect not only our institution, but all the institutions that pull together really helped us get through the early parts, those dark days. Michael? You know, th there wasn't any time to really um, lose focus on what was important. And that was making sure that our kids received um, the best quality instruction under the worst possible circumstances. Um, it was really trying to focus on the kids as I had to 
you know, go back and forth with collective bargaining units and um, at times, you know, really get to some contentious conversations. Um, it was really about keeping everyone focused on the well-being and the education of our students. I think people at some points, you know, and rightfully so during, you know, what was happening in our world kind of was looking at their little bubble, um, whether it was themselves, their children, their families, and that's understandable, but somebody had to be the one to kind of refocus them pretty much on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day that we have these 19,000 precious young people that we are charged and have a responsibility to educate um, so that they can one day when this is all over with, you know, be productive in their lives and, and achieve their goals and, and, um, and all the things that they had in front of them in their life. So um, that was the focus. I think looking back now, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how we did it, um, but, you know, but we were able to do some great things despite some extraordinary circumstances. And Daisy, you know, as, as reporter to reporter, there are sometimes when you look at something or you see something and you're reporting something and you're like, no, that, 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 no, I'm not seeing that. That can't happen. Did you have any of those moments uh, again as you're looking across the country? Yeah, it's, it's overwhelming to think, you know, when you're talking to somebody in California, you're talking to somebody in the Midwest, uh, how a lot of these stories just start sounding the same. Uh, I mean, obviously, the personal impact is really great. But in, in those individual stories as a reporter, when you connect with people, um, and also, you know, when you're in your newsroom, trying to gain that focus again, right, because all the information that's coming at you, it can get overwhelming. So yes, definitely. All right. This is not all just looking back. We want to also look forward because, as as Michael said, you're going back to school next Monday. So there and across the country and across the region, this is happening. So what were the lessons learned? I mean, we had to have learned something um, about how to educate our children, how to educate our children better. I'm sure things were tried and things were discarded because that's just the nature of when you're working in an emergency uh, situation. So how did things progress? Daisy, did you see anything nationally, you know, that were like, okay, this was good, this worked, this is going to be good as we go forward? Yeah, I, I, I reported on this with communities in, in the Midwest. Uh, there were some good models that came across, and I'm sure a lot of other school districts in other states are, are doing something similar. Um, so one example was in Missouri. Uh, like I mentioned, many schools and school districts uh, were lucky that they identified some of their gaps early on uh, entering distance learning. Uh, so for Missouri, what did they do? They hired uh, for this particular school, they hired bilingual staff um, as extra help, uh, community liaison specialists. That, that what, that's what they, they were calling them. So these uh the support system here is they were able to identify students needing more help. They visited homes. Uh, during the pandemic, I mean, I think it's still ongoing. They were able to establish relationships with parents, connected with par connected parents with community resources. Uh, you know, the stories that we heard, parents were being laid off, they were losing their jobs. A lot of them were struggling with paying the bills. But these, uh, this, this staff, uh, the support staff, were able to to kind of fill in those gaps with the support. Now the parent fe is feeling like they can really help their kids. They're they're not afraid to ask questions because it's in their native language. They know who to call parents, parents want to be involved and, but schools are, you know, usually filling that gap to facilitate that. And it's not always easy. Um, I'm told uh, there's still a lack of bilingual educators in, in the Midwest and in other areas. And so that's been a constant issue and, and it, it's even more so now. And, and of course, you know, there were also many, many stories of kids who didn't get that type of support. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, rural communities were especially lacking um, I spoke to a mom and her 12 year old daughter. And as soon as this preteen uh, went into middle school, right, like in the middle of the pandemic last fall, uh, instruction was mostly kind of like webinar style. Uh, she wasn't used to this. She was thriving. Uh, she was doing OK in, in a Zoom setting you know, with other students and being able to ask questions uh, when whenever she, she wanted to and wanted clarification. Uh, but now the student was falling behind. 
uh, her homework started piling up. She developed anxiety, um, long evenings trying to meet deadlines. And, you know, she's only 12 years old. And, and her mom had some English proficiency, but she also couldn't, you know, she couldn't keep up with that. And she didn't know who to call for help. Um, and so, you know, webinar instruction is not for everyone. Even college students struggle with self-directed work. And, you know, with online classes when you don't have somebody to ask questions, right? So, yes. Uh, so, you know, the good thing here is that the student was able to to go back into kind of like a hybrid model and she's thriving now because she's she's able to ask those questions right so yes hiring these like community liaisons is like one solution that that i saw that seemed to work very well for for school districts that were able to afford it michael any bridgeport examples things that you know you say hey this is we're, we can take this and now move it forward to the fall of 2021 well, I think one of the things is the continuation of in integrating the technology platform even now so, so that we are prepared so kids know how to log on and access the online curriculum if we have to pivot even for a week or two weeks that there are no gaps. Um, we also learned that it's not about mastery of all the content. It's really about making sure that students are learning, students are progressing and they're growing. I think we get a little hung up sometimes in education on complete mastery of lessons and units. And, um, you know, I tried to, you know, we had this conversation uh, last week at a retreat that I had for my administrators at Sacred Heart. Um, if you think about all the information we all learned from K through through 12th grade, how much of it did you, did you actually master? Um, very little of it did you master, but it's really about teaching the skills so what we're trying to do is um, look at some of the programs that we can have, uh, whether it be an online program, an application or something that if we have to pivot, it really teaches the critical literacy and math skills that can fill the gap so that when kids come back, they can just seamlessly come back into the classroom. Um, we did fill a lot of the gaps that Daisy mentioned when it came to connectivity. We were fortunate to do that, to have access points to send home, um, and, and those kind of things. But I think it's important that we look, we are looking at products, especially for our early learners that once downloaded onto an iPad, we can send it home and Wi-Fi is not necessary for them to access the learning. Um, it was, you brought up the thing about mastery of subjects and a Paul Simon song came to mind, which I'm not going to sing right now. Dr. Nachman, um, again, what about the health and developmental concerns? What did we learn? What can we bring forward? Because again, as you said, this has been rough um, for the students. Um, is there anything that we can bring forward to help them as they hopefully transition back full-time for good into class? But if things kind of remain up in the air, what can we do? So I think the first is I want to acknowledge that the schools did an amazing job of not having COVID infections in the school. That pretty much every time we heard about an outbreak, it was rarely, if ever, associated with a school. It was always a party that the schools went to or a gathering or something like that. It was not with the schools. So despite parents are saying, oh, we want this, we don't want this, we don't like this, I want to really commend the schools because last year there were so many potential events that could have happened and actually did not. And the children were safe in school. And I think that was the biggest message for me is that despite the uncertainties, was the virus going to mutate? Was it going to become more contagious, more dangerous for children? Were the numbers going to go up? In fact, the schools did an amazing job. And as I tell every parent, School is the safest place for your child. Yes, home is a good environment. But when I think about the learning environment and the safety all bound up together, schools are pretty much the best place for your child. So I think that doing what they've done and what they're planning to do this fall will be critically important to getting our kids back to semi-normal. And I think that will work. One of the things that we tell parents are, Think about who your child is, where are you going, and what are you doing outside of school? Because that's really going to affect what they do in school. So if you're outside of school and you're saying, oh, we're not worried about infection, we're not going to be thinking about masking, we're not going to be taking care of ourselves, we're not wearing seatbelts, that's the message your children will learn. But if you're saying the school is doing the right thing, 
They are concerned with safety of all the people, not just the children and the teachers, but everyone in the building. And we acknowledge that and give them credit for it. And we're gonna follow what they're doing. Your children will take that message home. They'll learn from you and they will continue to be safe. So I do think it's that relationship between parents and the school that has been so rewarding. Yes, in difficult times, the school shown, they did a great job and yes, some were hybrid, et cetera. But I very much agree with Mr. Testani that the children need to be back in school. That is the best place for them. It will be bumpy. We are gonna have outbreaks and your children may have the need for a counselor. Talk to someone in the school. There's a guidance counselor. There are other staff in the school that can help them. Don't ignore the problem, but also don't think that keeping them home is going to avoid any problems. It won't, and it may magnify it. All right. We had asked our listeners, those who had registered, we had over 100 people who registered for uh, this, uh, join the conversation. And we also reached out through our new partner, Harkin, uh, which is an engagement tool that we're using so that we can have a conversation with the community and asked a simple question for tonight's uh, event. And that is, do you have any concerns about sending your child or children back to school this fall? Now, out of the answers that we received, some were very simple. Yes, no. But we had others that were pretty thought out and, and I th thought were very intelligent questions. We had teachers across Connecticut and Long Island say they were uncomfortable with bringing all the, vac all the unvaccinated children back into the classroom, while other teachers said, no, I have no concerns. We also had parents say that the hybrid or remote model didn't work. And one teacher wondered how kids were going to get educated if there wasn't a hybrid model in case a student became exposed and had to quarantine. Daisy, mm -hmm. what are you hearing about that specific issue across the country? Yeah, so I, you know, it's it's all over the spectrum, right? Uh, I think that I, schools are as ready as they can be at this point because you know things keep changing. Um, and and Mr. Testani said earlier, uh, you know, we have the tech. Uh, most 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 schools were successful in getting the technology part in, right? Um, it wasn't perfect when it came to trying to get parents, you know, up to speed on how to connect. You know, I think those are like concerns that that people are gonna continue to have um, and parents are, are returning to work uh, if maybe they're finding some work after a year off. So there's gonna be those struggles, right? That they're going to be going through. Um, and I've heard from some parents and advocates that say that, you know, they hope the pandemic is a wake up call, right? And that we don't go back to normal. So I think that's a message uh, for a lot of schools and school districts as they faced the last year, right? Like I think if they were able to mobilize quickly uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, I think um, we we should be in a good place right now. And that's what I'm hearing from from parents uh, at this point. Michael, how is Bridgeport handling that? If a, if a student gets uh, is exposed and has to quarantine or if has to leave school for any reason for any amount of time? Well, we had that conversation today and we're looking to hire some part time staff. Um, teachers that would not be full-time, but uh, to be able to service kids throughout the district that may have to quarantine. Uh, so they have some face-to-face -face through the virtual platform to interact with teachers. Um, but as the, as as Dr. Nachman mentioned, schools are the safest place to be. We had over 12,000 students attend last year, over 37 buildings. Um, like I said, 159 days. And between staff and students, we had less than 600 positive cases reported to us. Uh, that was most of the year without a vaccine. And over 90% of those were linked to outside exposure, especially when it came to staff. Um, whether it was a college age child that was home or, or a teenager or someone that was going to work while um, exposing them. And the same was, was true for our students. So um, I, I think it's important because we have all the PPE, we have all the mitigation strategies, um, and we know in many of our homes, uh, they're multi-generational. So that was the major concern last year is exposing grandma or grandpa to, to the virus. But with the vaccine now, we had a great summer with summer programs. We had zero incidents of COVID reported to us during our summer programs. Um, so we're happy to see things returning to a sense of normalcy. And if we have to pivot and kids do have to quarantine, 
um, we will have some staff members that will be able to service them. But I think what Daisy mentioned earlier, um, the real shortage of, of bilingual educators um, for students, and, and like I mentioned, with the students of special needs is, is a major concern. And I think this is something that could be a wake up call for state certification boards um, and colleges and universities to make all teachers prepared to be English language teachers and all teachers to be prepared to teach kids with special needs, not just certain specific um, specialized areas. Now, several parents, again, through Harkin, told us that they'll get their young children vaccinated the moment they're allowed to do so. We did get someone who chose to remain anonymous, and I think this is maybe part of the legitimate confusion that some parents and teachers are having. If we can't vaccinate our kids, why can't we go back to the protocols that we had early in the pandemic? Face masks, six feet apart. Yes, I know we've, all, we've had the face mask mandate now, but six feet apart, hand washing, limited physical contact, and regular testing. Is that because the science and the medicine has changed, Dr. Nachman? So it's not so much that the science and medicine has changed, but those mitigating strategies added stress to our children's lives. And when I think back to the measles outbreaks that were in the 1980s and before, when I think about why vaccines became required for school attendance and how that's come forward over the years between polio epidemics and measles epidemics, et cetera, there was a reason why vaccines were required for children to attend school because it was protecting everyone. So while those masks and six feet apart, et cetera, those did work and they were a great tool. We also have to look ahead to the future and say, what are the next tools that we can use? And are there better tools or a combination of better tools? And I suspect like those parents that said, yes, I'm afraid, no, I'm not afraid. They're all in the gray zone because in that gray zone, we recognize that we have some tools, we would like better tools or even the best of tools. And we're getting close to some of those better tools. Yes, masking works and we do have a mandate to wear masks and I'm very excited because I think that will protect the most people in every one of our buildings, be it a work building or a school building. But I do think that vaccination is another route to protecting everyone. And at the end of the day, as a pediatrician, I don't wanna see a single child harmed, certainly not an adult, for those of adults on the call here, but I certainly don't wanna see a single child harmed. And if vaccination is the way that we can get our community safer for all children, that is something that I think is a great goal that we should all kind of look towards. So yes, the masks work, the six feet work. Were they practical? Are they livable all the time? No, they're not. We need better tools and we're in the middle now. We're still gonna be wearing masks. We will not be six feet apart. We're starting to get vaccine rollout for the 12 and older. And hopefully in the next several months, we will get vaccines for the younger ones and get closer towards that goal of maybe no more masks are needed. Now, another uh, listener had a question coming from the other angle on the same topic, and they're saying that they're concerned that the mitigation that we've done is not enough now because of the way the Delta variant is changing. And they were thinking more or less, well, what, what else do you have there? Do we recirculate the air in the classroom? I know um, Daisy probably in most of the schools across the country or in some of them, that's not possible. In Bridgeport, it might also might just be opening up a window. I mean, that was the type of school that I went to. Um, but they're concerned that somehow it's changed, that we're not, our mitigation isn't strong enough. Is that a fair question to, to pose? It's certainly a fair question for us right now because we'd like to do more or we want to get to 100% of prevention. And for every measure that we do, there is a, did it work? Was it worth it? Did it really help? So it's hard for me to comment on the air exchange and the air purification, but you're right. That's just another part of the equation, but we still have to think about the big picture. And the big picture starts with, if you're not well, don't come to school. If you're not well, don't come to work. And if you can prevent infection by getting a vaccine and wearing a mask, those are the things you should do because that's gonna be 90% of getting us there. Daisy, what are you seeing as far as mitigation across the country? I mean, we see, you know, well, we hear through the media, you know, some places, some states, it's they're doing a good job. Others, 
it just seems to be laissez-faire. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of like reporting on like the mitigation efforts. Um, I, I think that parents and I, like we said earlier, are more comfortable with having their kids in the classroom. Uh, uh, like the example of the student, uh, the 12 year old and, and her mom just struggling at home. Um, yeah, even with, before a vaccine was made available um, last year, she went back to the classroom and she's thriving there. So, uh, yeah, I think for some of the most of the parents that I've talked to right now, uh, it's the, the information is confusing, right? Uh, every school has different ideas on how they want to go back to school. Um, so they're, you know, always checking in and trying to see, like, you know, what, what they can be doing better. Um, but I think the majority are, are happy to, to get their kids back. All right. And then one, one last question that we got in, and I'm just throwing this out. Anyone can jump on it. How can parents partner with teachers to make sure their kids hit their educational goals for their grade? And I think that's something that you brought up, Michael, where we talked about mastery of a subject as opposed to just like, let's just pass them through, you know, what can we do to say, okay, my kid going from sixth to seventh grade has what they need to know so that they can have the chance to thrive in seventh grade? Well, I think one of the big things is keep an open line of communication. Um, we're currently working on rolling out a new uh, messaging system. Uh, the district, we had uh, really a general messaging uh, system where you know, principals can send out phone blasts or emails to parents or the district, but there wasn't that ability for teachers to have an open line of communication. So we're investing now in a program where teachers have the ability to communicate through an app, just like WhatsApp or any of our, our, our messenger and be able to have open communication with parents. Parents have the ability to download. Um, the parents can choose up to, I believe, 60 languages so the teacher may send it in english they'll receive it in the in the language they prefer they'll write it in their language the teacher will receive it in in, in english so that line of communication and i think it's important more than ever for uh, for parents to make sure when kids are on their screens that they're doing schoolwork i think that was one of the biggest things is that a lot of parents thought because the laptop was open or the tablet was out that they were interacting uh, with their class and doing schoolwork. And many times we noticed that that's not always the case. So, you know, take a look what they're doing, ask some questions, you know, take, shut the screen off at periods of the night and see if the kid can pick up something to read, whether it's a book, a magazine, um, something they have an interest in and, and, and ask questions. I mean, we're really trying to push to Daisy's point for our English language learners, to have our parents access our adult ed program here in the district. We offer classes day in the evening so that they can learn together and that, that parents and, and families can sit around the table, practice and learn and hopefully grow a, as a community. Anybody else want to add anything to that? I'll go right ahead and jump to that. No, it's interesting you mentioned, uh, Michael, the how the technology, right, and setting up students with computers at home, I think a silver lining to that is uh, I have heard from other parts in the country that now their parents can join their the English classes, right? Uh, they don't have to navigate this new, you know, how do, I don't have a computer at home. How can I do that? Uh, they can learn together at home. And I think that was one of the most interesting, like really nice things that came out of that. So, yes, we are seeing some solutions, uh, some really nice, innovative ways to to get families together and to learn together. Um, so that was really nice. I think the other part, which is always amazing to me since I'm not a new learner, is how skillful our very youngest children are with the computers. You know, I can get on the laptop and my grandchildren will change my background, change this, do that. And I'm like, show me how you did that. I don't know how. So I think our younger learners having started now in those kindergarten, first, second grade with their laptops right away, while well, you're right, we don't want them playing games on the computer. They are actually soaking in technology that we would have never introduced to them at that age before. If you had said, give a five-year-old a laptop, no, absolutely not. They should be playing on the computer. Now that they have to use the computer for school, or unfortunately when they're home and they're hybrid because there is an outbreak in their household, they're actually learning skills that are really critical. And I think 
we need to think about what computer classes we're teaching our youngest and how soon can we get them educated about not just the Zoom, not just the classes, but other computer skills that will really put them ahead as they get older. And some of them are learning it on their own and some I hope we can still teach them. All righty, school starts Monday in Bridgeport and in many places across the region. The following week, the Tuesday after Labor Day and in some places like New York City, it's the following Monday. So are we ready? What is going to be different this year? What can parents, teachers, and students expect? And uh, I'm going to ask the question, although everyone has told me so, will we be able to pivot if things change and go downhill sooner than just if things change? I think we're definitely ready. I think the difference is going to be, uh, at least on, from our perspective, the first few weeks of school is really going to be just getting kids reacclimated. Um, socializing with their friends, um, getting used to the environment. We're not going to be throwing um, a whole heck of a lot at them all at once. Uh, we want them to get spoon fed slowly, start experiencing some success, easing back into the classroom. Uh, no standardized testing or any type of assessments the first month of school. I think we already have a pretty good idea of where kids are. Um, and, and I don't think just, you know, spending and wasting time uh, assessing kids at this point is going to be the way to go it's that social emotional component um really getting kids back used to being with friends and, and out of isolation that's going to be our goal um i don't think and and i think doctor will be able to say this i don't think we're going to need to pivot the way we had to pivot in the past um at least not for the length of time that some people um thought um we did, like I said last year, for a brief period of time from Thanksgiving to the winter break. Um, but right after the first of the year, we were back in and that was without a vaccine. So I think we're in a much better position right now. The one thing you asked earlier, if we learned anything, I, I think one of the things that I, I didn't mention is that we learned that devices aren't all the same. You know, there are more appropriate age appropriate devices for each of the grade levels going as we go up. So I think it's important to make sure that the device and the grade level of the, and the age of the child are appropriate so that they're able to experience success navigating the device and it just doesn't become a, a frustrating tool to them. Daisy, are we ready? I think so. I think that uh, a lot of educators, schools are going to be thinking now, like, how do we move ahead from this, right? Um, they're, you know, these positions that they hired for to get, you know, be community liaisons, those were temporary. And I think that a lot of parents and a lot of teachers want those to be permanent. Uh, and there's also going to be, you know, uh, starting resuming these services that stopped for students during uh, the worst days of the pandemic, uh, more one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, for your special education students, you know, uh, IEPs and individualized education programs, uh, get those reevaluated. Re -evaluated. Um, students are waiting to get that done um, for their initial evaluation. There's a backlog of that across the country. So I think that's where a lot of the attention is going to pivot to um, for, for a good thing, right? And Dr. Nackman, are, are the kids ready? Are so the ready? kids are the kids are definitely ready. And our advice to parents is talk to your children, look in their knapsacks, that black hole of information of stuff that has to get to you, what's in there. You know, I think that one of the lessons our, teach, our parents learned last year was that it's their job as much as the school's job to make sure their child is successful. It's a real partnership. And I think just because the kids are back in school doesn't mean that parents can say, all right, it's your job now, I'm done. And I think that partnership must endure. So I think from a medical perspective, we are absolutely ready for the kids to be back in school. From a developmental perspective, I think we've learned a lot last year about how critical those parents are to the success of their child. And that I hope that ongoing dialogue of, are they in class? Are they learning? What's in their knapsack? What are their assignments? And are they paying attention to them? And as you said, are they playing on their laptop? Or are they actually doing their homework on their laptop? Those are gonna be critical messages. On the other hand, you know, I think that stuff has changed over the years. And in the past, there was a lot of emphasis, for example, on cursive writing, how to write script, 
When you ask someone now, are they writing cursive? You know, you get that sort of funny look. Why do I need it? What I'm using it for? So now we're emphasizing all the things about motor skills. Can they type? For those kids that are falling behind, what services do they need so that they can stay on top of their motor skills? What else do they need? So I think that idea of the partnership of how important the parents are and how important the school is, and it's together they'll make their kid a success, I think is a lesson learned moving forward. And that we need as parents to make sure that we are hearing from the school, is our child having issues? And the school needs to hear from us as well. My kid is playing on the computer, they're not doing their homework, or they're having some smoking or drinking, or they're just laying around and not going and doing anything. That partnership must endure and get stronger. You had me laughing at cursive because I, I wrote a note to Janice Portentoso, our producer, and as soon as I wrote it, I couldn't read it. So <laughs> talk about a useless skill. Uh, we talked a lot tonight. Is there anything that we left out? Is there anything that any one of you would like to add um, that you feel is important information for those participating tonight to hear? I'm just going to echo what the doctor just said. I think this partnership between the home and, and the school um, needs to continue, continue to grow, get stronger. And together we can ensure the success of our children. It's a bumpy year. We've gotten through it. This year we'll have some speed bumps as well. I recognize that. I'm planning for it. The schools are planning for it. But we will get past it. And it's only because all of us are actually part of the same community, getting our kids safe and growing up, that we will succeed. All righty. Well, this has been a really enlightening and respectful conversation, which is good around this topic because it has been contentious. And I want to thank all three of you. Daisy Contreras is the educator, uh, education reporter from The World, uh, which is a daily radio show uh, produced by PRX and WGBH. Michael Testani is the superintendent of Bridgeport Schools. And Dr. Sharon Nachman is chief of pediatric infectious diseases at Stony Brook Children's Hospital. And thank you all for tuning in tonight. If you don't already, I invite you to tune into WSHU or follow us on social media for our reporting on important regional issues. Find everything you need at WSHU.org. This Join the Conversation was produced by Communications Director Janice Portentoso, Senior Producer Ann Lopez, and Engagement Director Joanne Sear. Erin Jory Swank from Shindig was our stage manager. Tom Kuzer is our program director. Rima Dial is our general manager. All you need to do to leave the event is just close your browser window and that's it. So again, good night and thank you. And uh, here's to a good school year.